how to get what you want. Unlimited energy, confidence, and happiness specifically. I want to talk about those three things in this podcast. Hey, I'm Peter. Welcome to Waking from the Fire. I'm wearing my Spartan t-shirt. It's sprint. It's not a marathon. It's not 25 miles, but hey, it's something that's just right for me. The reason I'm wearing the shirt and the reason I mention it is when I did my Spartan, and one way that I get through them is I want an unlimited energy, right? The energy to train and the energy to run up and down those mountains. And if you've ever done a Spartan or a Tough Mudder or any of these obstacle course races, you crawl underneath barbed wire and mud, you climb up over walls and mesh netting, you do rope climbs, you do monkey bars and all that stuff. So you need unlimited energy. But you and I also need unlimited energy in life, in our professional life, in our personal lives. If you have children, you know this, you're going to be up late and you're going to be up early, right? So you're not getting much sleep. So I want to talk about unlimited energy. Then I want to talk about confidence, confidence to be able to go through and do something you've never done before. And I've done a lot of races, but when I did my first one, it was way, way back in, I don't know when. And it was a, a probably a 5K, and then it went up to triathlons. And then I did a marathon, never again, once was enough. And then I ended up settling with Spartan races and Tough Mudders because I love them. They're just long enough and challenging. But that works for me personally. That motivates me. It's something to work towards. Think about that too. If you're in a rut, plan something exciting. Uh, if it challenges you, if it makes you get in better shape, that's a bonus, right? That's built in. Health is built in. That's that's awesome. So when you get to that finish line, figuratively and literally, you're going to look and feel better doing it. But it doesn't have to be a race. So I wanted unlimited energy. I wanted confidence that I could do it, that I could do something that I haven't done before. Look, I've done Spartan races before, but I've never done this particular one. It was out in Bethel Woods where the amazing Woodstock event really happened. So there's some uncertainty, there's some fear around that, um, but you can also switch that. You could redirect it and focus that towards excitement. I remember Barbara Streisand and Bruce Springsteen, someone talked about them. I don't know, you know, I've never double checked this, but it made sense. So Barbara Streisand did her last concert and then she did her last concert again and last concert again. And it was always the last concert and it was kind of a joke about it. And one of the reasons I read that she did that is she had stage fright. She had this terrible, terrible fear of being singing in public. Amazing, right? A woman with such a beautiful voice and so talented. And then Bruce Springsteen. So, so Barbara Streisand would feel those butterflies, that gut feeling, that panic almost. And then I heard, I read about Bruce Springsteen and what happens before his concerts. He feels the exact same things. But the way he interprets it is excitement anticipation um like it's incredible what i'm doing yeah it's scary i don't know how it's gonna go i hope i sound good my guitar doesn't break i don't fall on my face kind of thing but if i focus if so what he did was focus on it's exciting so those same feelings of anxiety and apprehension he turned into confidence by saying this is what it feels like to do something exciting and to follow my passion so that was awesome and then happiness I don't know about you, but I'm happy when I accomplish something. And most important, I think, is if it is in line with my purpose in life. And for me, being healthy, challenging my body, staying fit, uh, growing, aging gracefully, if you want to say it, is so important. So that so doing a, something like a race, some type of physical um, challenge, for me, lines up with my purpose. And that makes me feel fulfilled and that makes me happy. So, and I'm not a genius. I learned all this stuff through trial and error and personally trying to get what I want. Okay, so without further ado, unlimited energy. I'm gonna give you a second here. You can answer this question. You could send it. Well, I'm gonna give you the answer, but I'm gonna ask you the question anyway. Where do we get energy from? Where does energy come from? There's only one place. I'm talking about physical energy. I'm not talking about spiritual energy or metaphysical, if you want to get all Aristotle. Food. The only place you and I can get physical energy from is food, and it's called calories. I know that's a bad word for some of us, but a what a calorie is literally is a, a unit measurement 
of energy, specifically heat. Calories are measured in the amount of heat they give off, something scientific like that. I remember that when I was in nutrition school. So I want more energy. I'm going to go right to the source. I learned this as a physical therapist. If I, if someone has knee pain, I'm not just going to put an ice pack on it. I want as a, a healer, as a practitioner, whatever you want to call it, I'm going to go right to the source of my patient's pain. It's the swelling is not the source of the pain. The swelling is a complication of it, a manifestation, a symptom. I want to treat the cause. So I want more energy. I'm going right to the source and I'm going to go right to the food. And I'm going to look at two things specifically about food. Number one is how much, because if you're measuring something, you can measure how much. And just enough energy is going to give me the fuel that I need. Too much energy is going to make me gain weight and if, have all kinds of negative consequences for my health, but also for my psyche, because I don't want to be overweight. Not eating enough food is not going to fuel my workouts or my work or my just my energy to do the things for my children that I want to do or to be present in my relationships um, to, you know, whatever it is that I want to do, I want the energy to do it. So I'm going to look at food. How much? Let me, this is, this podcast is not long enough to go into it. If you, if you really, really want to know exactly how much you should be eating, and what you should be eating, message me. Do a coaching session with me. I'll, I'll show you everything you ever needed to know about how much to eat, what to eat, and how to eat psychologically and physically. Seriously. I mean, uh, literally. So I'll give you an example. I eat on average 1,800 calories a day. When I say that, now I'm six foot four, I'm really active, I have pretty good muscle mass and I have low percent body fat because I work at it, right? I'm not bragging, I'm just stating fact and I get that by doing all those things. I look and feel the way I do and I have a body composition because I pay attention to how much I'm eating, what I'm eating and how I'm training my body. Or you can call it exercise if you want. So I eat 1800 calories. If I do a search on Google and type in 54 year old male, six foot four inches, 225 pounds, it's Google's going to tell me that I should be eating about 2,500 calories a day. That's way too much food because it's a, it's a scientific equation or a measurement or whatever you want to call it. It's too much food. As a nutritionist, I know that for me personally and for my clients. So 1,800 calories a day is my sweet spot. If I eat that many calories, I will not gain weight and I will not lose weight. I will maintain my weight and I will look and feel the way that I want to look. Most of my female clients should be eating less than that. They hate when I tell them that, but it's just, hey, it's not me. Don't kill the messenger. It's just what it is. So there's a way to change a perception about that. If you think that 1,800 calories of food isn't enough, then you're right. It's not enough. But if you say to yourself, okay, 1,800 calories, I'm going to try it. I'm going to put my faith in it. I'm going to see what happens. Then you're going to come to the same conclusion. And if it's not right for you, you're just going to tweak it. Whether it's 1,900 calories, whether it's 1,500 calories you'll figure it out. But, you know, at any point in time, anywhere from 80 to 90% of this country is on a diet. And if I ask a person who's on a diet, how many calories should you be eating to lose weight? Maybe less than 1% of the population will know that answer. Very, very, very few people will know that answer. Not because they're dumb or illiterate or any, any negative thing, just because we were never taught these things unless we pay attention to them. And then if we do hear about these things, they must be, they might be misguided. We might be getting them from the internet or from some company that might want to try to sell us a product or some type of strategy or something. It may or may not be accurate. So if, again, if you have specific questions, message me, get the answers. You'll never have to guess again how much you should be eating to lose weight or to maintain a healthy weight. It's not complicated. I, I promise you, it's just there's so much information out there that's distracting and deceiving. So unlimited energy. For me, it's 1,800 calories a day. That's how much. Now what? It's not, I could eat McDonald's 1,800 calories a day and I won't be healthy. I might not gain weight, but I'm not going to be healthy. I'm not going to feel good. I'm going, here's what's going to happen. If I eat McDonald's every day, 
And believe me, I know what it feels like. I grew up on McDonald's. My mom was a single parent, raised three kids, immigrant from Greece. She was too busy working a sewing machine uh, in a factory to make dinner. So she would pick up White Castle and Burger King and all that stuff on the way home. I don't judge her. That's the best she could do. So I know what it feels like to eat that food. If I ate McDonald's, I would be bloated. I would be sluggish. I would have foggy brain. My mood would be irritable. I would, if I would feel like there's something wrong, there's something missing. I would be impatient with my children. I have observed all this when I don't eat well. I have observed these behaviors and I can tie them directly to either eating certain foods or overeating foods. That for me is incredibly helpful because then I can make an adult decision and say, I'm going to choose to eat a cheeseburger with french fries and buffalo wings because I want to. And I eat those foods. After my sprint race, I ate, that's exactly what I ate, cheeseburger, french fries, buffalo wings. And later that night, I had a steak for dinner and more french fries and then some side dishes. I had some vegetables in there. Don't worry. I got my veggies in. But I'm literally eating those foods. Um, so let me get back to what I was saying. If I eat certain foods, and it's, it's gluten for me, it's processed foods, it's foods with added chemicals, with hormones and antibiotics, genetically modified foods, I don't do well with them. And guess what? Most of us don't. Most people have either a food sensitivity or food allergies or food intolerances, and then they have things they don't even know because they wouldn't tie, let's say, being irritable feeling angry, being tired to what they just ate. A lot of people don't make that connection. Maybe you do. And if you do, then you can make a logical decision. So how much I'm eating, I'm focusing on, and I'm focusing on what? I'm eating clean foods 80% of the time. If I'm eating animal protein and I do eat animal protein, I don't think you have to be vegan or vegetarian to be healthy. If you look at the healthiest people in the world, they are not vegans. They are not vegetarians. I'm not saying those are not good things. I'm just saying you don't have to do those things to be healthy. The healthiest people in the world eat very small amounts of good quality animal protein, meaning organic, grass-fed, wild, locally sourced, grown by a farmer that you know, treated humanely, all those important things. And they eat tons and tons of plants. Broccoli, sweet potatoes, white potatoes. White potatoes are healthy too. But they get such a bad rap. My God. Greeks have been eating white potatoes for years up in the mountains and they live to 100 years old. They don't get cancer. They don't get diabetes. So don't worry about potatoes. It's just the way we eat them in this country, unfortunately, and around the world. So make that a once in a while thing. Again, the 80-20 rule, right? 80% of the time eat lean, good quality animal protein and mostly plants, greens, uh, if you're going to eat whole grain, if you're going to eat grains, make sure they're whole grains. But I would limit the grains too. There's so much research saying, saying we're eating too many grains, even if they are whole grains. And I, not, just an example, not to explode your brain, but a whole grain brown rice is considered a whole grain. I'm pretty sure. Last time I checked, it was a grain, but it's whole. It's brown. It hasn't been denuded of its uh, how you find it in nature, but it has arsenic. And so white rice, it has arsenic from pesticide runoff. So white rice actually has less pesticide. So can we say that white rice is healthier because it doesn't have arsenic, but then it raises your blood sugar and can be a precursor to someone getting diabetes? Again, I'm not trying to explode your brain. I'm just trying to say, keep it simple, eat good quality animal protein, and eat tons and tons of fresh vegetables, greens, starchy vegetables, uh, beans, the healthiest people in the world eat beans as a staple. And they're just, they know where their food is coming from. And they're keeping their food in very simple forms. They're preparing it very simple. They're eating seasonally, simple things. Okay, that's unlimited energy. We can go on and on about that. We could literally go on for five days. Confidence. Here's how I have found that I can create confidence because I'm not always confident is if I could th think about what I want. So again, I'll use the Spartan race. I wanted to compete in the Spartan race because I feel like it's a challenge. It's exciting. And I'm, I'm going to be honest. I, I want to be able to say, hey, I did a Spartan race, right? I want to practice what I preach as a health coach, 
as an inspirational speaker. I want to do something that is challenging and then say to my audience, to my friends, to my children, who are the most important, hey, I did this and I did it with confidence even though I was nervous. So know what you want. What do you want? I wanted to challenge my body. I wanted to challenge my mind because it's uh, physical and mental to overcome that. A lot of things in life are like that. They have a physical component and they have a mental component. So I knew what I wanted. I wanted to complete this race for so many reasons. I wanted some excitement in my life. I wanted something to look forward to. I scheduled it at the beginning of summer so that I could look good going into summer, that I wasn't behind the eight ball and I had a, oh my God, I got to lose 10 pounds because two, in two weeks I'm going to be on the beach and I hate taking my shirt off and not feeling confident. You know, that, that motivates me. That works personally for me. I don't think it's vain. It's just, I know who I am and I know what I want. So when I know what I want, it, it creates confidence in me. Why do I want it? Why did I want to complete this race? Well, I, I shared some of those reasons with you. I want to challenge my body. I want to stay fit and healthy. I want to inspire my children. I want to be a good role model for my kids. I showed my kids my training. I showed them pictures of me during the race and after the race. I shared with them my journey. I want to be a good role model for them. So that creates confidence in me because I'm doing something that I want to do and I'm becoming educated about it. I learned how to train for it. I prepared for it. I scheduled. I signed up. Like These are all things that adults do when they want something in their life. They want to bring something into their life. So why? For self-esteem, for purpose, for health, for um, parenthood, being a good role model to my kids. Those are the whys for me. Okay? And I'm just trying to read my... And then here's the other thing with confidence that I don't hear about often, but I figured out, I, I must have heard it from another mentor. When I'm doing something, let's say I'm speaking to an audience and I, I'm thinking about it, I'm creating a vision and I'm seeing myself in front of this future audience, am I sincere and authentic? So those are the questions I ask myself when I want to accomplish something, when there's something that I want. Am I sincere and authentic about it, meaning why do I want this? Why did I want to complete this race? Why do I want to speak in front of this group of people? Is it to impress them? Is it to show them how amazing I am? And oh my God, Peter is so incredible. He does these things. Now I'm not going to lie. That has crept in in the past because I didn't understand who I was exactly and what I wanted. That's also a very long conversation but a conversation that I love to have with my clients if they're interested in hearing about it. That was a very long road and that's so important. But I know now that I can let my ego get in the way of something and that's a problem because now I'm not doing something with confidence. I'm doing something, oh, I hope I impress them. You've heard about this imposter syndrome. I talk about this all the time. That's when I, let's say I say, hey, I can do this job. I get hired for it. They pay me. And I'm like, oh my God, they're going to find out I'm a phony. When they find out, they're going to be pissed and they're going to fire me. Or they're going to be angry. They're not going to like me. That is basically imposter syndrome. It's, you know, you could describe it more professionally, but that's how I think about it. And guess what? Everyone experiences imposter syndrome in their life. So if I know that, then I, I want, again, Remember when I said in the beginning, I want to go right to the source. I want to know what I want, and I know I want to know how I'm going to get that, and I know I want to know why. I want to identify why do I want to do this? Why do I want to complete this race? Why do I want to be a good parent? Why do I want to speak in front of this group of people? Because I want to help, because I care because I've learned things in my life that I think could be helpful to others, because I've stumbled and fallen, I have failed. If you want to call it, you know, whatever you want to call it, you can call it failure. Whatever it is, I have done things that have not worked, and I want to share that, especially with my kids. They're going to make their own mistakes. I'm not going to stop them from making their own mistakes, but I could say to them, hey, you're going down this path. I went down this path. Here's what happened to me. You make your own decision but I'm just giving you feedback. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. 
and they're they're going to go on they're either going to listen or not and let's say they listen and they go on their own path they're still going to come up with their mistakes the things that they're going to do that don't work they're going to learn from them pick themselves up dust themselves off and go on and get to the next level of whatever it is that they want okay so confidence comes from knowing what you want knowing why you want it and this is not the only way we get confidence this is one of the ways and being sincere and authentic. I want this because it's who I am. It's what my purpose is. It's what God wants for me, if, if you're spiritual. It's what I've always been destined to do. It's what makes me feel fulfilled. Like those sincere, authentic things create confidence. They build a foundation about over or for what you want most, okay? And finally, happiness. I talked about this before happiness doesn't just come at the finish line i felt happiness during my training because i was doing what i wanted to do and i saw myself progress i saw myself doing more pull-ups i saw myself as i was running my sprints running feeling like i was running a little bit faster i felt a little less tight a little less restriction so i felt happy about those things as i was experiencing physically and observing progress and that makes me happy and fulfilled driving up to the event i was excited i was with my partner ariel and i was looking forward to it even though i was nervous it was kind of that bruce springsteen thing hey i'm going to do this thing i'm nervous about it but i'm also excited and the anticipation is excitement it's about feeling alive okay during the race i was tired i was running up and down hills i was covered in mud my feet were in three it felt like three feet of mud caked and plastered on my legs felt 10 pounds heavier each but i was happy because i was doing it i was going through it i was saying okay i gotta slow down a little my heart rate is racing i don't know if i'm going to finish this thing at this pace so i gotta slow it down i even walked a bunch of times so what it's all how you interpret anything i could be beat myself up and say i had to walk it come on years ago i didn't have to walk it so what so what i accomplished it I'll train a little bit harder for the next one. I remember what I need to work on. It's okay. It's all growing. It's all, Frank, my therapist, taught me this. It's all how I interpret everything, right? If I can interpret being out of breath at a certain point in the race as, okay, I know what I have to do. I have to train a little bit harder with this event. Or I can look at it and say, hey, I'm still here. I'm doing it. I'm going to finish this thing. Okay, I'm not, I'm not doing it as quickly as I want or with... As much of a spring in my step but that's okay i'm going to be gentle on myself i'm not going to beat myself up that's another thing that i encourage my clients and my kids don't beat yourself up don't be so hard on yourself especially when you're trying to do something good okay fulfillment i talked about so happiness fulfillment fulfillment for me and from what i understand comes for a lot of people comes from purpose knowing your purpose I tied in doing a Spartan race with being fit, with being a good role model for my kids, with being a good speaker, being engaging, being um, interesting, giving people different experiences, uh, lessons of experience. So I tied in this whole race to what makes me, to my purpose, which makes me feel fulfilled, which makes me feel happy. I hope all of that makes sense for you. I just wanted to share these three things that I experienced personally during this race and working up towards this race. But it really is, it, transcend, it can transcend any area of our lives. Energy from food, confidence from knowing what we want, and happiness from finding purpose and feeling fulfilled. I love hearing from you. Send me an email. Uh, connect with me on social media. Until next time, I'm Peter.